I'll leave this on. Now, can you hear me? Because my connection may not be brilliant. Yes, I can. We okay? Um, so, uh, welcome everybody to RAG. Happy New Year for the start of RAG's spring term. Um, so we're coming up for almost a year now with, uh, with the Zooms, or it will be by, by Easter. Um, but the great advantage of Zoom is that we've got a really international um, spread and linkage. Um, so this term's uh, uh, lectures are um, politics, human origins and indigenous worlds. Um, we're going to have a series which are evolution, evolutionary ecology at the beginning, including um, stuff on lethal weaponry, stuff on Neanderthals, um, stuff on the evolution of music. Um, but the first two, uh, Chris is going to give us his the lowdown on origins of language from his forthcoming book, which is co-authored with Jerome Lewis. Um, later in the term, we've got quite a number of um, social anthropologists with uh, uh, looking into cosmology, hunter-gatherer cosmology, um, but also some very uh, political contributions on um, indigenous uh, Adivasi in India and the education system that's being imposed on them, um, which re is very reminiscent of the stolen generations of uh, peoples from the US, the boarding schools of the US, Canada and Australia. Um, so, so some uh, up to the minute indigenous um, political. Um, but tonight, um, for these first two lectures, we're going to get the lowdown from Chris. So let, I don't really need to introduce Chris, um, the radical anthropology founder. So um, take it away, Chris. Well, this lecture is about the evolution of language. Um, and I can tell you that the first word ever spoken was spoken by a woman uh, and it was no. This is a, a book which Jerome and I have called When Eve Laughed. And what we're doing is trying to show that laughter is first of all, everybody knows who knows anything really about hunter gatherers. Laughter is the, the main leveling device that among hunters and gatherers that prevents anyone from getting above themselves. But what we're particularly saying is that laughter, because it is a leveling um, me mechanism, because laughter brings people down to earth, um, it actually is also a, a bonding mechanism. Those who laugh together are, are bonded and, and having laughed about problems, uh, it, it, it just it creates the atmosphere within which, laugh, within which language uh, can flourish. Um, so what Jerome and I are doing, we're, we're really saying in one sense, there can be no such thing as a theory of the origin of language. We, we really do have to forget the idea that there's a theory, any kind, even possible theory, which can explain language in isolation from all the other things which make us human. And so we kind of need a theory of everything, um, a theory of all the things which make us human. Um, and so that's, that's why I, the, the book which we've sort of written, half written, is so very different from other books which claim to be about the evolutionary emergence of language. So perhaps just to, to start with, um, one of the features that um, inspired the book is, is something which uh, uh, Jerome Lewis, um, uh, Dasha Bombakova and others have described among the, 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 the uh, the, the Benjeli hunter-gatherers in the Congo that Jerome uh, and, and Dasha and, and Morn as well have, have been learning so much from. And there's a particular kind of laughter, a particular kind of um, performance, um, which when we thought about it, Jerome and I, we just thought, well, kind of that's it. This particular kind of performance contains in embryo everything you need to get to a gender egalitarian society, but also to get to at least the beginnings of, of language. From that performance, everything else can flow. And it's called Mwajo. And Mwajo doesn't need words. Mwajo is um, a performance. It can be men, men can have Mwajo. Uh, uh, so for example, uh, Jerome describes how men who are, who are 
preparing for a hunt or out hunting, they can they can really have a, an extraordinary laugh among themselves about all the ridiculous mistakes they've made and all the encounters they've had with animals and all the embarrassments they have in the hunt. And they kind of a, a, a laugh about it all. And, and what they do is they, it's, it's not verbal really, it can be verbal, but it's almost no words involved in it, certainly not any grammar. It's just a, it's mimetic. People just act out the idiocy of the, you know, of their, of their own behavior, act out the interaction with the animal, and they just have a, a, a wonderful laugh about it. And the, and the laughter brings everyone down to size and, and generates this, this confidence and trust necessary for a successful hunt. Um, but in some ways more subversive and politically significant is women's laughter. And that's also called mojo. Um, and what happens is that um, maybe um, some, usually, some, usually a man, so a, a man who's been behaving in a foolish way, ridiculous way, getting a bit above himself, throwing his weight around. What begins to happen in the way Jerome's described it is usually it's a senior lady, a, a, a grandmother, and she'll just start very subtly um, mimicking the behavior of the, of the target. And she'll just emphasize that person's idiosyncrasies, his, 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 his twitches, his, you know, and, and before long, several other of the, of the older ladies will recognize exactly who she means and start to laugh a bit. And before long, there's a whole gaggle of women and younger, younger girls as well joining in the laughter. And they all know exactly who it is whose behavior is being mocked. And it, this spreads and spreads and spreads until everyone's an absolute splitting their sides with laughter. And, the, and while acting out the, 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 the same um, image of the person they're laughing at. And the way Jerome describes it is that before long, everyone is laughing except one person. And that's the person who's been made fun of. And what happens is that they just keep on laughing and laughing and laughing. And it's absolutely merciless, but it's also generous and inclusive in the sense that what the women want is for that person, that man, that idiot, if you like, to finally kind of join the human race by seeing himself the way everyone else is seeing him and join in the laughter now at his own expense. So he now laughs at the fool that he was uh, only, only recently. And what that means is that he is now showing him, showing, demonstrating in practice through his own laughter, that crucial psychological cognitive factor necessary for language to exist. And that's intersubjectivity, or to put it more less technically, seeing yourself as others see you. So it's through joining in the laughter that everyone else is enjoying, that a person becomes aware of them of, them, of themselves, um, and, and but in addition to that, what's happening in, in this mojo is that it's it, it's kind of ritual, but it's not solemn; it's playful, and because it's it's targeting the potential for alpha male dominance, it's also political, as well as leveling. And the more we think about it, the more it's got all the ingredients in itself necessary for language to begin to evolve. And that's a slightly different theory from the classical Durkheimian theory. Um, but but on, the, on, the, on the other hand, it's, it's also similar. So just to, just to recap, um, Emil Durkheim had the view, and it's a very powerful one, that in order for language to begin to exist, concepts have to start to be shared. There have to be some concepts which are communicable. And his theory, which is a very good one, is that it's only through ritual, collective ritual, repeated ritual, um, ritual action that a, a group of people, a whole community, if it's a community-wide ritual, become aware that they share a concept in common. So it could be a certain kind of dance in, in, in Aboriginal Australia, which where his material came largely from, it would be maybe the kangaroo dance or the, the emu dance. And what happens during the ritual is you all become aware through, through action, through pantomime, um, of this particular concept of the animal that's being danced. And as a result of that, uh, totemic ritual in this case, humans acting out as if they're uh, an animal species, um, uh, which is of course a kind of metaphor, because it, it, as, as Durkheim points out, if, you, if you're acting as a kangaroo and you're insisting beyond, beyond just similarity that you are a kangaroo, that's a, that's a very powerful metaphorical statement. What that for, for Durkheim is the, is the basic condition for concepts to become communicable initially through gesture, but then of course you can have shorthand versions of those gestures and for language to begin to evolve. So what Jerome and I are doing was thinking, well, that, that sort of, it raises a whole lot of questions. Where does the ritual itself come from? 
um, how did it all begin to happen? Where, you know, why would you start to get, uh, in, the, in the case of an evolving hominin, you know, in our case with Homo sapiens, sapiens a species of great ape, where would totemic ritual begin to come from? But as soon as we think of Mwajo, it becomes a bit more clear what its dynamic is, what would be driving something like ritual, but, but far more playful and, and humorous. Uh, and, 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 and it sort of it, it encapsulates within itself all the necessary ingredients of intersubjectivity and play and pretend and metaphor necessary as a sort of matrix out of which one of those aspects, namely words and grammar, which we call language, can begin to um, emerge. Um, so um, I said that a sort of short version is that the world's first word uh, was spoken by a woman actually we would say women collectively, and it was no. But of course, if you only have one word, and, and any theorist would maybe just think, well, you know, it's a, it's a sort of philosophical issue. What, could there possibly have been a first word? Why would there just be one? But on the other hand, philosophically, it's kind of <laughs> logical necessity that you begin somewhere. But of course, if you only have one word, um, is it a word? Um, Ferdinand de Saussure famously described a word as, 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 as always meaning what it is, what it defined by what it is not. You can't really have one word. You can't have night without day. You can't have light without dark, hot without cold. If, you, if you've got one word, what exactly does it mean? And you can see immediately that that word has that one word. If you have only got one, it kind of, it means sort of everything. Uh, and also kind of nothing, maybe something like, well, you know, here we are, we exist, we're, we're celebrating our very existence. And so the, the, the idea is that that is expressed through, through laughter, uh, and in particular, um, subversive laughter, uh, kind of turning the world upside down sort of laughter, and that would mean in, a, in any kind of male-dominated society coming from below, coming from fundamentally from females. Um, so, um, okay, what, what our book tries to do is to go through a whole sequence, so, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's a very un, uh, kind of unusual book, and we, 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 we're quite pleased actually that um, so far everyone that's looked at it has been very supportive. It's a sort of detective story, and what we, what we do, we start out with a very strange incident. Um, um, which, in fact, Jerome experienced um, only a couple of years ago um, among the Batek people in Peninsular Malaysia. So um, Jerome describes how he, with uh, Ingrid and his and his and his and his daughter Inea, um, they were staying in the forest with their Batek host in a in a wooden lean-to, a, a, a hut, and um, suddenly there was a so there was a sound of thunder approaching and there was an, it got louder and louder until there was an immense thunderstorm and a, a, and a massive tree was struck by lightning and cracked in two. Um, and their Batek host um, knew exactly what to do. And she took a razor blade and uh, cut her leg, cut her lower part of her shin. And um, she asked one of um, Jerome's um, PhD students who was doing research in that area, that the host did, the Batek um, uh, woman um, asked her to, to um, take her blood, collect the blood in a, in a bucket and throw it up into the sky and to say to Guba, um, we are, we, we didn't laugh, we're innocent. We're not, we sh you, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be um, um, threatening us in this way. And, and, and so in that whole region, very wide region actually, there's a fundamental taboo which people mustn't um, violate, which is you mustn't laugh at animals. And so Jerome and Ingrid and his family, they began to say, well, what, what exactly did we do wrong? What was it that caused the thunderstorm? And they remembered that they had noticed some leeches with their long noses looking for blood, and they kind of laughed at these leeches. And, um, and the, 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 the Batek they were staying with said, well, that's it. You laughed at those leeches. And that's what, that's what annoyed Gubar, the, the great thunder god. And um, so, it, it, okay, that sounds, <laughs> sounds a very strange place to start a book on, but what we're trying to say is that if, if language evolved in this species and no other, and if language actually is, 
when you, when, whenever we speak, and this is something which um, Ludwig Wittgenstein and, and John Austin and many other philosophers have worked at, when we speak, um, what we're doing, we're not really making any moves in the real world. When we speak, we're making moves in virtual reality. To speak is to do things with words and things are, things are done, think, think actions are accomplished, but saying something doesn't affect physics, it doesn't affect bodies, it doesn't affect you know, anything really, except what it does do is it makes a move in, in, in terms of altering um, a shared perspective on the world. It makes things as collectively perceived different. So you're moving in virtual reality as opposed to in reality. Now, if you're moving around in virtual reality when, when you speak, and it's, I think everyone who's thought about these things realizes that's what's happening. You're not moving in the, you're not making a difference to the physical world or the biological world. You're making, you're, you're making moves in a, in a kind of virtual world rather than as, and this is another standard um, sort of metaphor in, in linguistics, rather as when you're playing chess, you keep, you're making moves on the chessboard by moving your, your knight, your bishop, your king, but you're making moves in a world which only exists because you all agree on it. Now, as soon as you recognize that that's what's going on with language, you realize that religion has to come into it, that religion is, is, is the world of shared belief. As soon as the belief in the spirits, the gods, the, the totems, as soon as, the, if, as soon as the belief collapses, or if you, if you move out of the culture into another part of the forest or into a local town uh, where people don't have those beliefs, suddenly all those powerful spirits, all those powerful beings, which, it, which, are, which exist because everyone believes they exist, but doesn't, that doesn't stop them from being real, of course, as Jerome keeps pointing out. Jerome points out that when you're in the forest and it's suddenly you're, you're, grass, you're, you're seized by a spirit, Jerome just says, well, you, every, you feel the spirit, it's, it's absolutely real, it's, it's, it's definitely there. It, it causes, you know, it, it can stop you from, from success in the hunt, it can make you ill and all sorts of things. So these, of course, are what we call in, in standard philosophical terms, institutional facts, facts um, which depend on collective belief. And um, so you have, the, the world consists of two types, categories of fact, if you like, brute facts. So a brute fact might be death or a brute fact might be gravity or something. So you don't have to believe in gravity to fall off a cliff if you walk, you know, walk over it. But institutional facts are, believe, are objective facts. And they're, not, they're, not, they're not just subjective, they really do exist. But they exist only thanks to collective belief, and so that's the, so the, the whole of the first chapter is trying to establish this point that as a, as speaking creatures, we humans exist in a virtual world, and it's just not possible to explain the origin of language if you don't have a theory to explain the kind of virtual reality we entered into when we became the symbolic species, and why precisely it was that 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 symbolic reality was the way it was, the, the kind of virtual world which, among other things. Uh, gave rise to gave rise to language. So, I mean, obviously, a, a lot of people just would, would immediately say, "Well, come on, well, you're making a huge mountain out of a molehill. What, what's the problem?" I mean, uh, so okay. So, uh, for example, Steven Pinker, very, very senior evolutionary psychologist, wrote a whole very, you know, very good in many ways book, widely read, "The Language Instinct," and his theory is very simple. It's just that language evolved by natural selection, and why did it evolve? Well, because it's good to be able to communicate efficiently. If, you, if you've got a, a cooperative species like, like we are, uh, having a, a crude, inefficient system of communication isn't anywhere near as, a, as an effective, sophisticated, efficient um, system of communication. So for Stephen Pink, you don't even need a theory, really. You don't need a particular theory to explain the, the events which led up to like proto-language and then language and then maybe more, more grammatical language than previously. You don't, you don't need all that. All we need to know is that Darwinism works by natural selection. Those who began to develop a language instinct uh, like over, over a period of millions of years would have survived better than those who didn't simply because you could communicate more. You could therefore, you know, instead of having to live by trial and error, you could, you could benefit from the, the, you know, the experiences of those around you and language is just going to evolve. Um, that uh, sounds a very reasonable um, theory. It's just that, um, no one has been able to agree that that on, on any details in that theory and it's just so general that it kind of doesn't really explain anything and above all if the argument is that simply being social means that there'll be obvious advantages to having language 
we have all kinds of paradoxes and I don't really want to spend too much time on these paradoxes but the, but the, 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 the interesting thing is that chimpanzees who are very closely related to us um, are great apes of course uh, extremely social creatures Machiavellian political creatures how is it that they, these close relatives of ours it's not just that they have a rather crude uh, if you like language instinct grammar instinct they seem to have no grammar instinct at all and one would argue that if being more social means like a, a primate develops more of a language instinct, more of an aptitude for grammar, language instinct, by the way, of course, simply means the fact that, I mean, humans have it. Every, every child is born with an instinctive appetite for grammar, if you like. It's extraordinary how quickly kids learn language at the age of, like, you know, even you know, 18 months or, or a couple of years. Uh, whereas chimpanzees have absolutely no, they can learn a kind of American sign language, but they have no apt aptitude for grammar whatsoever. Um, so we have these paradoxes. And so it isn't, it isn't simply like being social that, that makes language possible. There's a particular configuration of sociality. Uh, uh, you know, and in terms of looking at sort of the history of life on Earth, it, it seems probable that just as the emergence of life on Earth Nobody knows quite what it was that happened, but it was a, almost an inconceivable, um, improbable, you know, odds against life evolving on a planet. Then it had to be very specific circumstances, and one of them, of course, was a huge moon. Um, and we could go on. In the same way, Jerome and I, and I are saying, actually, to work out the origin of language, we, we have to be almost like historians or prehistorians. Something happened, something profound happened. It wasn't just becoming more social, something very specific uh, happened. And the, the way we need to think about trying to find out what it was that happened is to kind of reverse engineer from today's hunter-gatherers um, uh, and, and particularly the kinds of religious and ideological constructs that, that are shared among all the world's hunter-gatherers. And, and, and when we say that, we're saying, actually, if you look at, if you're careful about it and, and investigate further, you find that actually, it isn't just hunter-gatherers, that all the world's magical myths and fairy tales, all the world's religious structures, they all have certain core features kind of in common. There are variations of a theme, of course, but from that, this is the point, from that strange batek taboo against laughing at animals, is it, can we almost work like in, as, in, as detectives? Could our book even be almost like a detective story? It does that, does that, paradoxical rather odd detail of a thunderstorm caused by laughing at leeches uh, and others have described laughing at millipedes for example as well as monkeys and and so on that, that does that give us a clue um to to, to to what it was that happened when language itself emerged so i mean and then jerome was was uh, astonished really of course in, in the in in among the better because he remembers himself how he was told in in the congo um that you must never laugh at the at the animals you've hunted, and particularly is you mustn't laugh at the wounded animal, the bleeding animal. Um, and if you do, you'll lose your aquila, you'll lose your hunting luck. Um, and then it turns out that going right, right back, you find all over the place with with hunters and gatherers and others um, that animals are sort of protected by guardian spirits. You have the mistress of the game animals, the master of the game animals. And, you've, and, and these, anim, these mistresses and masters of the game animals, these are the same as the, as the thunder gods. These are the supernatural potencies. And, um, and we need to work out what, not just, we can't isolate the problem of the emergence of language from the, the, the problem of, it, of its wider context, the emergence of this particular um, symbolic uh, complex. So, okay, I, what I'm going to try and do today is just have, a, as Camilla mentioned in the intro, just the kind of part one and part two. I'm not quite sure how far we're going to get with part one, but um, uh, okay, um, no, the, first, the, world's, the world's first word being no, not spoken exactly, but actually in, in, in laughter. Uh, a chorus of laughter, as it was, was suggesting, would have been the first sort of word because that chorus of laughter would have had in, in, in it that the bonding, the trust, and, and perhaps certain, uh, in, from which, as, as, as history proceeds, separate out the various components, if you like, the religious component, the linguistic component, the economic component, the, the, the kinship component, wrapped up in that wanja, that solidarity of women, and that laughter 
there are all the different aspects which which we, we, we term symbolic culture on all, on all those um, different um, levels. So um, chimpanzees. Um, chimpanzees, as everybody knows, I'm sure here, um, common chimpanzees are, uh, I mean, the, 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 the principle of social organization is called dominance. And, um, and the, the male dominance is often extreme. It does depend on, on local conditions, on the availability of resources, but chimpanzee males are very competitive. Um, every single uh, male uh, chimp, even a, even a you know, relatively immature, uh, relatively young adult will dominate all the females. And rape is, or if you like, the, I mean, the term rape, you might feel it's a bit you know, um, anthropomorphic, but anyway, sexual coercion is almost normal. And dominant male chimpanzees will sexually coerce their sisters, um, certainly other females, uh, and, and of course compete against each other to exercise that, um, that, that coercion. And one of the reasons why female chimpanzees make a big effort to get out of the way as they become sexually mature is, is, to, get, is, is, is to get away from their, 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 their dominant male um, relatives. Um, because Otherwise, of course, it would be, you know, there's, there's a reason why incest wouldn't be particularly um, you know, good. Um, that, and and with, with common chimpanzees, the, 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 the need for the females to um, forage in isolation from each other, because the, 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 the um, resources, the local resources aren't all that abundant, um, just means that every female wants to really be in charge of her own cabbage patch. And, um, it's when you when you hear the sort of standard narratives about human evolution and the origins of language, and especially I'm thinking now of Richard Wrangham, for example, a very senior, very influential, very you know, accomplished primatologist. He does take it for granted that our earlier ancestors, the early hominins, were chimpanzee-like in their social arrangements, essentially male-dominated in their social arrangements. Um, and of course, most standard narratives of human evolution, including the evolution of language, are one or another version of sort of man the hunter, man the toolmaker, uh, and so on. And, um, and these are regarded as not very political theories, they're just, you know, kind of standard theorizing about evolution that has been going on for, you know, ever since Darwin and, and maybe before. Um, so I've got to, um, I've got to, sorry, I've just got to put, plug in my power because it's got detached on my computer. I don't want it disastrous if it goes off. Okay. Uh, and so what, now, now what, what's happened recently is absolutely brilliant. In the last, what, I suppose 15, 20 years is that um, a, a, a woman primatologist, Sarah Hurdy, who's been writing since uh, the, the late 60s and 70s, um, the woman who never evolved, Mother Nature, Mothers and Others. She's been writing wonderful stuff, but only recently has she, has she, has she particularly since Mothers and Others, she's become very influential um, in terms of using her, her, uh, her studies of, of primates to work out the, the sort of constraints acting on, on humans as during our evolution. And the, the, the crucial point, which is missed out by all these man the hunter, man the toolmaker, and so on narratives, is, the, is the, the significance of infanticide. Um, so man the toolmaker, we just think about it. As, we, as our species began to evolve uh, the, the capacity to make stone tools, older one tools and the, you know, other stone tools, just think about what those tools were. There were weapons. You have a pebble tool, you have a hand ax, these, you know, these for one, one way, and of course, uh, spears and so on. And, and these are weapons that shed blood. And um, when you think about male chimpanzees and, and the, the degree of violence that they're capable of, including sexual violence, you, you just need to think a little bit about what exactly is meant by man the hunter and man the toolmaker and all these theories, which either, either make it explicit that males were the driving force or have a kind of unisex uh, approach where is, you know, females are sort of included. And the idea is that when we say, you know, and they've often said that when I say man, I mean, women are included. And, and of course, women are there because, you know, you've got to have reproduction, they get pregnant, they have babies and, and stuff. But when you think about it, um, the chimpanzee model is, it's got all sorts of problems. And infanticide is a, is a crucial one. Males will tend to 
kill offspring in females if they suspect that those offspring aren't genetically theirs. That's that's Sarah Hurdy's point. Um, and um, so, I mean, in in our in our book that Jerome and I are writing, we we we, we try to keep up with Sarah Hurdy and all the recent work, including by Camilla and others, on the evolutionary emergence of human sexual um, reproductive um, physiology starting with um, the concealment of ovulation and the, the, the sort of basic theory, well, I won't go into it all here, it's not really the point, but these different strategies and including physiological adaptations by females, for females, it's extremely costly to lose your baby. Um, and, uh, but, but on the other hand, if you have lost your baby to some male, then maybe as, as Sarah Hurdy was pointing out with the, with the monkeys she was studying, maybe it's a, 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 a fitness enhancing strategy to kind of cut your losses and uh, and get pregnant by the the, the, the infanticidal male, um, but still it's extremely costly, and you and you expect um, females to resist infanticide and form coalitions to resist infanticide until the, the very last moment. Once the baby is dead, uh, you know the, the female may have to start again. But the concealment of ovulation, continuous sexual receptivity. Cons confusion of paternity in other words to evolving physiological adaptations to make it harder for the for the males to be able to be certain whether they are the father or not the father confusing paternity and so sharing distributing a certain statistical probability of paternity among a, a wide number of males is, is a far more likely strategy than actually um, conferring paternity certainty on males which is again of course the standard model 10 15 years ago the idea was that um, in the course of human evolution, males would not have gone hunting and, and, and then brought back the meat to the female unless they were certain that they were the dad. And Sarah Hurdy has really exploded that whole, that whole notion. How on earth do, on earth does, do, do females in that early period um, you know, grant certainty of paternity through, through sexual fidelity uh, and some kind of monogamy for the female, um, which is you know, pretty much impossible even, even for humans today. Let alone in that period, without you know, before the the, the rise of uh, you know, patriarchal religious concept of of monogamy and so forth. So, move over now to a completely different um, great ape. And so, Richard Ragham and so many others have taken um, chimps as the standard model. If you want a sort of model for how um, our Australopithecines might have been uh, living, for example, or, or you know, or, or, and so on. So, completely different. Bonobos. Um, bonobos are the, are the great apes who cross the Congo, probably, I think people are now su suggesting a, a, only a million years ago. And as, so, the, so the Congo were pretty dry at a certain period, it was, it, it was possible to cross it. A, a group of, of common chimps did cross. And on the southern side of the Congo found um, wetlands, um, extraordinary sort of mixed water side ecology with really very lush uh, resources of shellfish, fish, uh, lily bulbs, uh, trees, of course, um, to, to, to sleep in and find shelter in and a, a, a completely different um, environment, which enabled um, females to forage uh, in groups. And the moment females were able to forage in groups and form alliances while foraging, everything completely transformed. So, so whereas with common chimps, infanticide is is, is, is a real problem. And a female who's moved out from her with common chimps, moved out from her, her, her territory into, into a neighboring group, she will be attacked by the, by the, the resident females as well as by... <laughs> right, we need to mute all, I think. Uh, is, I, I think we'll do that again. Right. So, so and, and this, is the, this is beginning to get to when Eve laughed now um, by a bit of a roundabout route. But um, bonobos, um, the females were able to bond, um, but there were still um, um, male philopatric. So bonobos, like common chimps, the females on, on becoming sexually mature, they move out of their local territory and, and get pregnant by in a neighboring um, group. Um, but the, the key thing about the bonobos is that they, they've, okay, what happens is that because the females aren't staying in their own um, natal group as they become sexually mature. Um, they can't rely on their mothers and sisters for support in childcare and other things. 
um, or any kind of solidarity, but what they do is they, they manufacture sisterhood. So the, the way to think of it, I think, is that the Bonobo females have evolved sexual swellings, um, which may, make it easy for them to, what's called GD rubbing, of course, the female, it's almost like a, a female you know, bonobo uh, with finding some food, you meet another female, maybe some competition for that bit of food. Maybe the females have hunted a small game animal with some little antelope or something. But it's almost like if it moves, have sex with it. The females have sex, bond with each other. And from now on, they're, they're, they're almost like sisters. They manufacture that bond and that enables them to beat up any male who might want to come along and steal their food, for example. Um, and the extraordinary thing is that with bonobos, First of all, they're pretty much matriarchal. It's quite a, quite a strong sort of linear hierarchical social structure. The males are, you know, they're, they're kind of, they rank each other and the females as well. Um, so it's not very egalitarian, but the, if, any, if any sex dominates, it's most definitely the females. And there is zero infanticide. There's never been a case reported among the bonobos who are very closely related to common chimps as well as to us, of course. There's never been a case noted of, of, of any kind of infanticide from males or females. So that problem has been solved. Um, so, okay, and moving on a little bit. What seems to have happened with humans at an early stage, and again, this, this involves all kinds of controversies, is that um, the, the, the most, probably the most revolutionary step in the case of evolving um, Homo, probably in the buildup to, to emergence of Homo, of, of Homo erectus, something like two million years ago, a switch from male philopatry to female philopatry. In other words, females switched over from having to move out um, on becoming sexually mature and then lack kin and, and, and have sex with um, outgroup males. In the case of humans, it seems if living with mum became the strategy, stick with mum, now, of course, that's not totally revolutionary because as Sarah Hurd has pointed out, among common chimps, that quite, quite frequently, I think it's in some groups, maybe 20% or 30% of the time, female chimps manage to live with mum. They don't move out. They stick around with their mother and therefore with their sisters. And in fact, the, the fitness of females who stay with their mother among common chimps is way, way, way more than the fitness of, of females who have to move out because of course, that they don't have the, the same problem of, of infanticide, which, which is a huge issue when they, when they move out away from their kin and have got no support. Um, so living with mum was the crucial step. And this, this of course leads to the grandmother hypothesis. If you're living with mum, you can start getting support from mum, which and of course mum is, the, is, is granny for your own kids. And of course, once you've, once you've switched over to living with mum, you will also be tending to live with your, with your siblings, with your sisters. And, that, and, that, and of course that gets us into Sarah Hurdy's idea that um, once, you, once you're living with your sisters, once a female's living with the sisters, she's got this enormous extra, very, very reliable childcare support. And, and, and of course, it, it just means that now that your babies, you can, you, you, can, you can hand over your baby to somebody else, your sister, your mother. Um, you, and, it, and that of course then leads to this very interesting psychological dynamic between the, the infant and its different carers, the infant and its mother, the mother leaves that leaves that infant with, with another mother with its, with a sister. The, the infant has to has to make an effort um, to be lovable, has to, has to coo and smile and gurgle and, and be be you know be, be adorable. And uh, but it but it has to make these cognitive efforts to to actually secure um, loving care. And this of course leads to this extraordinary feature of, of human psychology, this thing called intersubjectivity. You have to read others' minds. Um, and, and put yourself in the, other, in the shoes of the other carers. And, 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 and this, of course, places pressure on the brain to become more complex and, 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 and larger. And of course, the fact that the, the female, the mother's now getting childcare support from others, uh, as Sarah Hurdy points out, just means that the, the evolving human female can afford um, the cost, the enormous costs of giving birth to and, and nurturing and caring for um, increasingly large-brained um, offspring. Uh, Jerome and I have also focused on, uh, obviously, vocalizations. Um, now, again, um, <laughs> it's hard to know quite where to begin in a short, um, short presentation. But anything remotely like language 
Uh, to just perhaps say very briefly, um, language is a digital system of communication. This was worked out very lo long, long ago, partly by Saussure um, with his metaphor of a, ch of a chess game. So just the point here is maybe very, very briefly. Saussure said, think of a game of chess. You're playing chess, you've got a knight uh, on the board. You, you've lost your knight, it's gone under the table somewhere. Uh, you don't know what to do, but you want to carry on playing. So you 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 just you just say, okay, here's a button, um, and you put it on the board. And as Sophia points out, this button, once you've decided that it's a knight, it's not just a sort of a sort of knight. It's nearly a knight. It's a sort of vaguely a knight, or it's approximately a knight. Once you've agreed that it's a knight, it is absolutely as as much a knight as the the wooden piece which you've lost. The one that looks like a horse horse's head with ears. So there's a kind of all or nothing quality to symbols. It either is or it isn't a knight. And once you decide that this button is a knight, it's kind of full on that, that quality. It's an off on um, you know, switch, if you like, between being and, and, and not being. But, yeah, but Roman Jakobsen, the great um, uh, linguist, uh, uh, Russian linguist, of course, Roman Jakobsen, the founder of modern ph uh, phonology, he really worked out that that the whole of spoken language consists of offs and ons, of what, of what he called distinctive features. So voicing is off or on, nasalization is off or on, all the various other um, the elements that make up spoken language. The, 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 the vowels and consonants or the phonemes, which are quite complex um, units, are actually at a deeper level that you switch on or off one of these things each calls distinctive features. And that makes it a digital system. There are no, digits in animal signaling. That's a crucial point to understand. So, what, so I mean, again, I, I just feel that far too rarely are uh, those who just talk about language origins aware of the, the, the fundamentals here. So the fundamentals are, were worked out really by Ahmed Zahavi uh, in, in, a, in a book called, the, with his, well, he, I mean, before the book, long before the book, but his, his most famous book and wonderful book is called the, the Handicap Principle. And the idea here is that signals to be effective have to be costly. Um, and um, uh, the, the point about a digit is it, is it costs nothing. It, it doesn't, it, 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 if you think of two sentences, um, uh, we will meet you tomorrow. Uh, we will eat you tomorrow. You've, in the second sentence, you've removed, um, a, you know, a consonant, and it's, it's a life or death difference in, in meaning. Nowhere in the animal world do animals allow life or death distinctions to be accomplished at, at such low energetic costs. Animal signaling is costly. Not always. You know, obviously, the amount of costs vary. But what language is not is costly signaling. Language is because it's digital and therefore actually a zero cost system, in essence, of course, you can add costs, you can repeat things, you can sing them, you can shout, you can all those things. But in essence, the kind of language which, as defined by you know, linguists, uh, formal linguists, is uh, it's zero cost signaling. Uh, and that is simply a theoretical impossibility, which in turn means that language itself is in some sense theoretically impossible. It just, it, it's a good idea. It would be great if, you, if animals, maybe, you know, large brain, you know, great apes, it'd be, it'd be in, you, can, uh, you can argue kind of, it would it'd be very adaptive if they could have language, but it just isn't gonna happen. You cannot move from costly signaling to zero cost signaling without, some, without break, really breaking all the rules. And of course, what we're saying is that the rules get broken when your signaling isn't impacting on bodies isn't isn't body language isn't impacting on directly on other bodies on you know even on psychological states that it's merely impacting on cognitive states um and and that and that gets us back to where we started when you when you're speaking you're moving in virtual reality not reality and moving around in virtual reality it's perfectly possible to to, to have that, no energetic cost when you're playing chess it doesn't, you don't need to push and shove at the bishop, the pawn, the knight, the king, you know, it, 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 no energy at all is required. It's, it's effectively zero cost of signaling. And we have to work out how on earth you get there. So one of the things we're saying in the book, and I'm gonna to have to stop before long, otherwise I'll have gone a little bit too long, is, um, is to go back to singing. So Jerome is very strong on the issue of song as the, as the sort of material, the phonic material, the auditory material, the vocal material, out of which language emerges. 
So let's think a bit about this. Um, for, so the, the idea here is that when the first hominins began to evolve, um, and okay, I'm just perhaps quickly say, it, it, it seems to be about six, seven million years ago. And, and what we mean by hominins really is, is it's kind of walking on two legs, actually. That's a, an absolutely defining feature of being a hominin. Um, and it does now look, and it's what's so interesting is that Richard Wrangham and many other very you know, sort of mainstream primatologists now agree the initial kick, the initial push to walking on two legs was aquatic. Um, in other words, if you're, if you're in, a, in an environment with uh, water, um, you're, you're, you're foraging, you're needed to wade in streams, you, you're, you've got rich semi-aquatic resources, shellfish, tubers and so on, you, that, the water buoys you up, but also if you don't walk on two legs, you, you know, you've got your mouth under the water and you're, 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 you're drowning. So it's now become the sort of mainstream theory that the initial um, environmental pressure for beginning to move around on two legs was, was, was um, not exactly aquatic, but a sort of mixed water side environment, which is precisely the kind of environment which, as far as I can see, hominins have been favoured throughout the whole stretch of evolution. It doesn't, it means, um, it's interesting, um, Richard Wrangham calls this the savannah hypothesis. He says, by savannah, I mean, I mean aquatic, I mean mixed water side because it's still savannah. And I suppose you can stretch the word savannah to mean kind of anything you like really, but the, the, the crucial point is it's very, very rich resources. But one of, the, one of the points is that as our distant ancestors moved out from the safety of the forest into more open environments, including these mixed water side environments, um, danger from predators would have increased. So, okay, now why do, primates live in groups? Why do humans live in groups? It's very costly to be in a group. You've got all kinds of resource competition and conflict and harassment and so on. You know, it's, it, you need an explanation. And Robin Dunbar worked out this explanation a long time ago. He taught me a lot actually, by the way, at UCL when I was many years ago in the early, late eighties. It's predation pressure, safety in numbers. And in Africa where we were evolving, these would have been big cats. And I'll cut a long story short simply by saying that these big cats have superb night vision. Um, and uh, they prefer, they're quite, lions, even today, they prefer, they're rather lazy, they don't like running very fast, they much rather just pounce on you when you can't see them. And they prefer to hunt during the night, and particularly they, 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 they prefer to hunt um, during nights of dark moon. And we now, have, um, we now have plenty of evidence, plenty of you know, big statistics actually on, on lions eating human beings in Africa pointing out this is Craig Packer's work, but many others have, have confirmed it. So that around Dark Moon, during the night, you want to be really careful about look, you know, wandering around the place. So, okay, so our distant ancestors, we have to work out exactly what, would, what we mean here, but we're, we're talking about three or four million years ago, would have needed some way of seeking safety in numbers to keep, to keep safe from these big cats, particularly uh, at night and particularly uh, once a month for the three nights of, of Dark Moon. And here's um, Jerome's um, argument. He actually asked um, the, the Benjeli women, why do you sing all night? Why do you sing so much? Uh, and particularly uh, at night and particularly uh, when there's no moon in the sky. And Jerome's informants, the, the Benjeli said, we're singing for our lives. And it just, it, just, it just turns out that now we've had a lot more information since, since in the last few months, actually, we've met a few other colleagues who've confirmed this, um, that the particular kind of singing that the Benjeli do, the polyphonic singing, has the effect of intimidating predators um, by giving an impression of far more people in the group than are really there. So you can get five or six women with their kids singing uh, polyphonic singing and it, and it deters the predators. And the women themselves say that, it deters the, pre the predators. We're obviously in the forest, the Congo forest, we don't have lions, but we have leopards and other, you know, pretty dangerous animals. And um, the argument is that by singing, you, uh, you keep safe. That, that in other words, what the, what the informants are saying, you can, you can easily see why it would be, would be true. And then the singing becomes um, bonding. Um, and, 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 and there is a connection between singing and laughter. And, uh, and the, <laughs> the, the argument goes something like this. 
Um, what exactly is laughter? How do, what's the, what's the, um, what's the, what's, what are the, what would be the, 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 the out, out of what thing which non-human primates do might human style laughter have emerged? And the uh, chimpanzees have something called wah barking, which is a sort of chorus of barking, which uh, in particular, actually female chimpanzees, um, they, they produce this chorus of wah, how, how, how sort of uh, cacophony of barking uh, to express kind of solidarity with somebody who's been attacked. And it's often directed at an alpha male who's going on the rampage. And um, one of the, one of the main theories for the evolutionary emergence of laughter is that it's, it's something like wild barking, and uh, the term for that is mobbing. So many animals, of course, uh, in, when they defend themselves against some danger, some predator, they will mob um, that danger. And the mobbing takes the form of a sort of chorus of threatening sounds. And the argument is that human laughter was originally mobbing, producing a cacophony of sounds um, to keep the danger at, at bay. And what human laughter is, it's, it's, it's almost like the continuous, this is Eidelsfeld's theory, it's the continuation of some kind of vocal mobbing, but continued under conditions where the initial threat has dissolved. So imagine a group of, say, female hominins um, mobbing a, 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 a threat, and it could be a threat from within the group, of course, it could be a, a threatening male, but mobbing that threat, and then that threat dissolves and runs away. And now, the mobbing, the sound of this, you know, collective mobbing continues under reversed social conditions. Instead of being prompted by fear and anxiety, um, it's continued uh, as an expression of relief from the threat. Now that wouldn't be so unusual because actually, when you think about it, um, humans smiling seems to have been emerged, emerged from what with chimpanzees is a fear grin. So the human smile is no longer, you can have a sort of nervous smile, which is a sort of fear grin, but it looks as if the human, the distinctively human smile is a fear grin reverse, a fear grin under reverse social conditions of, of, re, re, of relaxation. Um, and so the argument that, that's, that, that, that laughing is equally a, a, um, a, like a product of, of reversal um, makes, would make a lot of sense. So, and then, and then finally, uh, this is the this is the cr a, a crucial idea of of Jerome's. He, the the people he he's been um, um, hunting with the Benjeli, They use um, vocalizations to trick animals. So um, and again, it's such uh, it'd be, it'd be brilliant if if Jerome was here. I don't think he is here this evening. He's got too much to do with the beginning of term. But he he will he is a real expert. As, I'm not maybe not as expert as the Benjeli are. At the kind of vocalizations which mean that you're, you're kind of communicating with the animals around you um, and, and he, for example he, he, Jerome describes how a certain kind of um, sort of you, you, you get your hand on your mouth you, you hold your nose you make a sort of choky sort of bleating sound and that uh, and it's the sound of a dico and, and, the, and you're saying to the dico little antelope uh, let's play and there's no way that 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 Dyker ever gets that it could be a fake, that that's, that, that sound practiced by a human could be a deception. Um, because they've evolved and the conditions of costly signaling and therefore reliable signaling, um, it, it, what, can, you can, what you can do, you can, you can say, let's play, the little Dyker comes running forward, you try and spear it, you just miss, it runs off, you do it again and the little Dyker comes back again. And, and Jerome discusses so many different ways in which, which the, the hunters he's worked with make sounds which are the sounds of the forest used deceptively in order to uh, practice successful hunting. And of course, okay, now you might, again, uh, you might ask, well, why, why do we need to go around that detail? Why would, why would the particular vocal dexterity which humans possess in order to be able to speak, why would you need to go around the detail of talk, if you like talking first to animals uh, before talking to each other as, as we do when we speak? Um, and the argument is quite simple, really. It's, it's the issue of reliability. If humans were to deceive each other very quickly, um, the recipients of those signals would, would, would resist. You do, you, so in a, in a human group, somebody kept lying, kept, kept giving false alarms, false signals. You just know that, okay, with well, that particular person, 
uh, particularly individual within the group, you're just going to don't take any notice. It's almost certainly going to be a fake. So the argument is that if you're just directing your vocal fakes at species that can't get the concept of a fake because they live in a world of reliable signaling, costly signaling, and then, then over time, the, the capacity for these producing these vocal fakes can, can develop. And then once for other reasons, once as a result of increasing uh, coalitionary solidarity, um, egalitarianism, uh, laughter, um, and, and, and therefore consequent trust, then you can redeploy those um, fake vocalizations within the group. Um, as, and the, the, the illustration um, um, Jerome gives is, is the good food grunt. So the, the, the bush pigs, when they find good food, they make a particular kind of grunt. Uh, and of course, a hunter could be coming back to camp with a, with a, with a pig uh, and he makes the good food grunt. And it's not that the people at the camp will think he's, he's a pig, uh, a, a bush pig. They will think that he's got good, he's got good food. So behind the behind the, um, the, the, if you like, the fake sound will be an honest intention. And that's the way language works. That, the whole of language is really based on interpreting the intention behind the sound, as opposed to the sort of intrinsic um, acoustic uh, signature and, and therefore intrinsic meaning of, the, of, that, of that sound. So, um, okay, so I mean, that's, that's sort of part one. Um, uh, maybe a few more things to be said. Uh, and, the, and the way in which the book works is through a really a kind of complicated detour all around the houses, but we finally get back to um, the, the world's first word. And this word is, it's not exactly spoken, it's, it's laughing, it's, it's miming, it's, it's pantomime, it, and, but it's bonding and it's leveling. So all the, all the things you need to get language off the ground are contained in something like Wajo, something like that performance, which is humorous and laughing, but actually ends up turning the world upside down uh, in, a, in, a, in a way which actually culminates in something. It, it, we call it the human revolution, of course. It, it, the world is turned upside down. And it's, it's not that language is the main outcome of that revolution. Language is one of the, one of the treasures, one of the features, one of the products of the, of the revolution that worked, the first, the first revolution, the one that made us human. Um, and that's, kind of, I think I better stop, otherwise <laughs> I've gone for too long. But I hope I hope you'll all be very um, sort of hostile and, and questioning and and you know and, and, and skeptical about all this because it's a very unusual way of approaching the uh, the question of the evolutionary emergence of language, completely different from anything else you'll have come across. I think. Hi. Hello. Yes. Hi. Hi, Chris. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much for that. I look forward to the. Uh, book. Um, I want to just um, ask, ask what you think about maybe what you finished with there and the, the human revolution and how language was an essential part of it. Um, I was watching a video last night by um, uh, David Harvey in which he demonstrated the um, expansive spiral-like um, dialectical method by which Marx unfolded the workings of the systems of, of capital, um, beginning with the commodity as the basic building block um, and teased open all of its inner relations from there. So revealing the contradictions between use value, exchange value, and so on until he had expounded the entire system um, operating in sort of combined but uneven development. Um, I was wondering what you think about adopting a method like that to apply to the question of human origins, where we might be able to put language and the development of language in the context of those other essential aspects. So I was interested in, um, you talked about standing upright as the initial condition um, by which uh, hominids came into being and how that would free up the hands to um, gesture, to carry, and let's take carrying as uh, a way to mobilize um, more effective caregiving. And you, you, you talked about, and therefore you could immediately see how um, 
communication between a mother and its infant might might become enhanced by that closer proximity, eye gazing and so on. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to ask in 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 the context of, say, say that methods by which Marx was able to unfold the workings of the capitalist system, what you think about applying a, a similar method to this question of language and, and human origins and the human revolution? Well, I thought I did apply it. Right, OK. There were, um, so I guess... Right, I began so, with I began with Marx. I mean, that's that's my method. I sorry, I missed the first few minutes. Oh, that's how no, that's how you listen. No, 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 no. I didn't today. I didn't. I didn't. I mean, I, I hope everyone can see. I mean, you know, one of the things that Robin Dunbar taught me, and he's a selfish gene theorist, one of the, the great, one of the greatest theoreticians of climate sociality. He said, uh, if Marx and Engel were alive today, they'd be they'd be behavioural ecologists. Everything depends on subsistence, and you, we don't have a mind first approach with it, you know events in the mind don't drive them in, you know, things which happen in the real world. We start with the real world and from there we get to um, things like virtual reality and religious beliefs and so on. So, I mean, I, the, the answer to your question is yes, I hope. I'm, I'm doing exactly <coughs> what I suggested and I have been all my life. Um, mm. So I don't know how familiar you are with my book, Blood Relations and all those things. I mean, that's as far as I'm aware, I've done that. I've just read Blood Relations. Yeah. Oh, well, done. Yeah. well, I mean, you have a quote from Marx at the top of every chapter, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, if you're, doing, if you're doing human origins, you have to be... It, you need to be a Darwinian. And, you, and more than that, you need to be a, a modern Darwinian. You don't, you, you know, you don't just have the idea of individuals under an environment with environment, you know, producing selection, but you, we need to do... Uh, so, you know, we need to understand the, the modern form of Darwinism, which is called self gene Darwinism, and that self gene Darwinism is all about how to explain this amazing feature of life on Earth, the extraordinary levels of altruism and cooperation. So, you know, people used to think that, you know, survival of the fittest meant sort of dog-eat-dog -dog or something in competition, but, and, it, and it kind of does, but the point about the modern form of Darwinism is we, 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 we're addressing the, almost like the miracle of the levels of cooperation you find in nature, and, and of course, among humans as well. And I mean, and, and of course, as soon as you start focusing on genes, and you realize that genes aren't in, you know, they're distributed, they're not just in, in this or that individual, they're all over the place, you can understand why it makes perfect sense that cooperation, you know, it, it enhances your, your genetic fitness. I mean, not always, of course, it all depends on the circumstances, but, um, but anyway. So, I, and my little, um, my little detour on, bono on bonobos, the, the, the bonobos are genetically very similar to common chimps. There's almost no difference genetically. Hardly the, you know, the, you know, the, the bodies are slightly different. The, the bonobos are slightly more, more, more sort of gracile. The, the females have bigger swellings. Their face looks a bit different. But I mean, the, the genetics is almost identical. And yet they have, I mean, they're so, so different. The bonobos have become so different. Matriarchy instead of patriarchy, basically, and all kinds of other things, of course. And, um, and Chris, uh, uh, so, sorry. As, um, as, a, uh, as, a, as a result, simply of different local subsistence conditions. The females can afford to be together as they're foraging. It makes all the difference. And th that in itself sort of turned the world upside down for these great ape close relatives of ours. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Chris, sorry, just following on from that about bonobos, um, how you said there's very little genetic difference. I was thinking, has there ever been a study where a bonobo has been raised and nurtured in a chimpanzee troop or ver vice versa? What do you think the resulting um, uh, ape would be like? Do you mean in the wild? Um, uh, maybe in the wild or, e or in captivity. I mean, I, I don't, don't know, just I've never heard of, of that happening. Well, I don't think it would be ethical for anyone to put a bonobo in a group of common chimps, and I'm, I'm sure that's never been done. Yeah. Um, the, bonobos, the bonobos that have been brought up uh, by humans and taught American Sign Language are a, a lot mm. more brilliant at, at working out you know what what to do i mean with uh, the most the most famous chimps who've been taught you know to, to sort of communicate with humans have, have tend to have been bonobos most of them and you can say to mm. um the bonobo you know open the fridge door take the take the orange juice out put the orange juice on the hat put the hat on the orange juice <laughs> they can get all that and not only that they can they can invent their own metaphors i mean they you know they yeah you teach them the word for shit and if you upset the, the, mm. the bonobo it will, it will say to you you shit 
or, or I mean, you know, so yeah, all, yeah, that's that's really all sorts of things are. But I mean, common chips as well. They're not that different, but there's just I think the bonobos have a mm-hmm. certain according to Sue Savage Rumbo, who did all this work in the eighties. The bonobos are mm. just that little bit more clever with picking up, you know, human language. I mean, why on earth, you know, yeah. in the wild that would be completely useless to them. Any kind of symbolism would be useless to them in the wild. So I mm. think the answer to your question is it's never been done. And I think it's also true that the, the bonobos might get beaten up by the common chimps. Mm. I think a male bonobo isn't as strong, uh, physically mm. strong as a as a as a male common chimp. I'm not mm. quite sure of that, about that. You know? Yeah, I just find that really interesting. The whole nature nurture thing, and, and about how you said that genetics uh, they're very very similar genetically, and um, and um, yeah yeah. But but like you said, it, it's probably be unethical to to do that in a zoo. You know, to have one one raised in another tree. I don't know if Camilla knows the answer to that. There, there is, a, well, um, it's possible for chimps and bonobos to interbreed, which, you know, puts a, a perspective on us and the Neanderthals, because uh, with the Neanderthals, we have a, a somewhat much more recent common ancestry. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the ethics of it would be completely impossible. I, I don't think mm-hmm. anybody would start putting bonobos alongside chimps. It's not going to happen. Okay. Um, okay. But, yeah. Uh, there are some questions on the chat. Mike Nelson had uh, was raising a point. Do you want to say something, Mike? Is Mike? Uh, oh, no. Uh, else just, was... Well, oh, not, not much more than what it said. It's, it's, I thought that paper quite a long time ago did language co-evolve with the rule of law. It's called something like that. Yes. Did the ideas mm. work alongside this? Is this? Uh, a newer idea is just replacing it because I was really impressed with that that it wasn't in complicated information like there are uh, uh, bison uh, 20 miles to the northwest but it was commands that language started with which goes along with the singing and the emotional uh, and it was uh, quite expensive to start off with that you know no sex uh, etc. Yes I, I'm glad you read that uh, piece I wrote, did language co-evolve with the rule of law. You couldn't have, I mean, David Graeber made a wonderful point, very similar. If, you, if, 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 if in a human group, if decisions were made with a big stick, you just beat somebody up, threaten them, reward them with a carrot or whatever it is, you, <laughs> language would be completely impossible. It just wouldn't be any point in having language. Language only works when the, you have rules of life and without the rules of life, you know, you're not going to get like rules of grammar. You're not going to get any rules at all. Um, and, and of course, you're, you're going to get certain statistical tendencies and dominance is a you know, primate star dominance. You can call that a kind of rule, I suppose, the rule of dominance. But it's, that actually means that, you know, you're, you're not going to get anything remotely like language off the ground. And so but I suppose the difference is, I, I think in, the, in that article I wrote, language co with the rule of law, I didn't have quite the emphasis which I would now put on laughter as the as a as a factor upholding a civilized, if you like, egalitarian um, social order. Um, this, this, I hadn't. I, I knew about laughter, and I, you know, I've written, you know, Richard Lee's wonderful work on laughter, how laugh, laughter works among the Kalahari Bushmen, and they're constantly teasing each other with with laughter to prevent anyone getting above themselves. But but I now understand more. I think more profoundly, uh, thanks to the work with with Jerome and others. That, um, that this so-called rule of law, and I, I don't mind calling it that still, is actually maintained by laughter. And I would say actually today, and looking at the world today, you know, we need more laughter. I mean, laughter is a wonderful thing and it's hugely subversive and, um, and patriarchy does not want to be laughed at. And yet if you did laugh at it, and we, yeah, and we know that there are historical examples Ceausescu in, in, in Romania, of course, when a whole population starts to laugh at some ridiculous dictator, he's had it. Um, and, the, and so uh, huge efforts are made, um, and, and Bacht, Mikhail Bakhtin points us out, of course, as well, huge efforts are made by all the bishops and the, and the, and the you know, the, all the, the, the high and the mighty, all, you know, the great and the good, to, to be solemn. All the patriarchal religions are, are all about solemnity and preventing laughter from anyone, but particularly, probably, Laughter from from women, but also singing as well. Yeah, uh, in in, in is more emotional content, yeah. and perhaps there was a transitional 
period where there was were expensive expensive signaling before they became yeah. purely uh, simple. Just to say, ne I, um... ne next, next week, just very briefly, next week I want to go into the really complicated questions about the origins of grammar. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be focusing on a wonderful work by somebody called Bruce Richmond, one of Robin Dunbar's um, colleagues and teachers, how you get from song, which is nothing like language, let's not forget that, laughter is nothing like language, singing is nothing like language, you know, laughter, singing, there might be conditions which make you know, social conditions that make language possible, but language is words and rules, and, and central to it is, is grammar. And, and um, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge to work out how from singing you're, you're gonna get to grammar. I mean, uh, but, but, but there is a way, and, and Richmond shows us the way in his wonderful, in the wonderful work he did, he did on choral singing, uh, um, uh, actually among Delada baboons, who not exactly, they don't exactly sing, but he was talking about the, the extraordinary degree to which they, they, they kind of murmur to each other and chatter with each other and in, almost in synchrony with each other. So his whole thing is about how synchronized sort of mutterings get, get eventually to pattern recognition through repetition. And actually he, he's got, anticipates most modern linguistics, which says that the language instinct in children is a play instinct, a, a, an instinct for pretend play and getting into each other's minds but, but fundamentally where grammar is concerned, it's about pattern recognition and therefore mm. sufficient repetition of formal structures for recognition to be possible. And it's the, once you get a, a, a structure of even singing, which is repeated with variation, you'll begin to get to grammar. The, 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 the invariant part of that process of varying the song is the grammar of it. And so- Is that next the, week? Sorry? Is that next week? I'm going to, the part two will be next yeah. week. Yes, right. that's right, yeah, yeah. Ta I wanted Tam to ask you a question, question about... Um, um, excuse me, Ta sorry, Ta Tam was raising his hand. Can we bring Tam in? Um, yeah. You can raise your hand if you want to speak. Tam. Hello, Tam. Thank you, Camilla. Yes, thank you very much, Chris. That was uh, hugely interesting. Um, I realise now, just in your, your last thing, that maybe uh, what I was wondering about is going to come to next week because... I couldn't get my head around the idea of speaking being virtual and that it, the I because I I think what I was thinking about was in terms of singing that I know as an actor how much it affects my own body mm. and it does affect the air it affects the world and it affects the other person um, but that I can see is uh, is more possibly geared towards. The idea of singing, chanting, and so on. Um, Jill Purse, a wonderful uh, polyphonic singer and teacher, uh, picked up from her the idea that she said that vowels are from the gods and consonants are human. Oh. <laughs> sort of seems to fit in a bit with uh, what you're saying. Um, so I look forward to next week in terms of that, maybe. Um, there was one thing I then thought about towards the end, what you were talking about. Ventriloquism was another thing I picked up. The idea I picked up from Ken Campbell that ventriloquism is older than humans, that insects have been shown that they will use ventriloquism in order, for example, to project their voice, project a sound away from themselves in order to uh, avoid attack. So you think that the insect is over there, so it gets pounced on and it, it, it avoids attack through a form of ventriloquism. Um, um, and uh, I'm really pleased to hear you say this about, I picked up on it when you did the, uh, the uh, Communist University about the aquatic ape theory, yeah. um, because I picked up on that from Elaine Morgan yeah. And I thought that really does throw a, an awful lot up in the air because mm. it takes away from the whole sort of macho sense of our origins and so on. And um, maybe that's what ties in with it, that human uh, about females speaking, because the, the, the women in the tribe would be just as easily just as uh, apt at going into the water mm. and uh, getting, you know, the, the fish or whatever uh, that. And so they would be just as much contributing rather than just being home looking after the children or that, 
uh, and maybe that's what yeah. brought language uh, to the fore a bit as well. Can, can, um, I say, yes. can, I, can I say, Tam, the thing about language speaking in the virtual world um, is, is just that language as defined by formal linguistics, when it's, it's simply formal digits, you know, in a sentence, but that, 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 that doesn't Im impact anybody. But, but the, the crucial point of all this is that Jerome says that we need to learn from these hunter-gatherers for whom there's a, there's a, there's a spectrum, of what he calls a, 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 a communication continuum. And, and for, for real people, there's not a thing called language which is separate from all the other things which you've just been mentioning, from singing, mm. from gesture, from emotion, from facial expression, and all these things, they're all connected up. But still, it's, it's still important to get to that last bit which the formal linguists, people like Noam Chomsky, but many others, of course, describe as, uh, okay, that's distinctively human language because other animals do a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, gibbons do singing, uh, many animals, chimpanzees incredibly orofacial. Chimpanzees have got amazingly expressive facial muscles and tongues and lips and stuff. So, and uh, you hear a chimpanzee pant each other, it just makes a hair on the back of your hair next down an end. But the linguist would simply say, that's not what we mean when we talk about language. So I, I'm, all I'm saying, I want our, our model with, to, to get to that point as well, without thinking it can be explained independently of all the other things which we do. And especially if you're a comedian, an actor, a, you know, a Shakespearean, you know, in the, in, in the theater, obviously nobody, you know, we just sort of, you just say, John is easy to please, or one of these silly formal sentences. I mean, you'd, 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 you know, you'd lose your job. I mean, there would be nobody turning up for your, 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 for your performance. But so, and then, and then just on the Ocratic thing, I, I'm agreeing with you. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Although, I, you know, the Ocratic hypothesis was a bit overstated, in fact, very overstated and a little bit too generalized. All the evidence now is, is coming in favor of something like a mixed waterside ecology as the kind of environment which we evolved in. And there are arguments actually, which I think I haven't really looked at too closely uh, about how it does seem to be those creatures that go into the water that, become, that signal more through sound than through gesture. There's, there's a reason why whales and dolphins and other necratic creatures prioritize the vocal auditory channel as opposed to the gestural channel. I'm not, I don't want to go too far down that road because <laughs> you know, I don't want to, you know, because obviously these are scientific issues we've got to get right. But I'm, I'm, you know, I do definitely agree with you, and I think most people now agree that, that the opposition to Elaine Morgan was some of it was was scientific and evidence based, but a lot of it was horribly, horribly ideological against um, a woman who was upsetting the apple cart and, and making them a lot of these experts look look foolish. And a female playwright as well. I know, is... I know, I know, I know. Yes. Staff, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, Staff. No, I appear as a piece of uh, a solid stick. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not an academic, I'm a musician, but I was intrigued by this idea about polyphonic singing as, mm -hmm. as a sort of defence against predators, because interesting idea, though it is, polyphonic singing is, is, is relatively rare, I think, and... Uh, it, it, obviously, Africa is somewhere that's quite known for polyphonic singing. But I mean, if that, if that's going to be a general conclusion, we'd have to have more examples, wouldn't we, than just these particular women that do this? Well, it's all African hunter gatherers do polyphonic singing, and among all those African hunter gatherers, uh, the, the, it is the women who carry the burden of the singing. And Africa is where our species evolved, and we have all kinds of other evidence that you know that people have. The people who live in the Kalahari, for example, have lived in that region of the world longer than any other people have lived in, in one region in any other part of the world. And there's lots of evidence, archaeological, genetic and other evidence for, for continuity. So, you know. So did, did we lose the polyphony when we left Africa? I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't quite see why. But of course, in many, in many areas, we, we may well have done. I mean, you know, it, or, 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 the fundamental thing actually is, is about the abundance of game animals. In Africa, we still have megafauna. So whereas when human, humans moved out of Africa, they, they encountered, you know, diprotodons, huge, you know, masupas in Australia, mammoths in Siberia, giant camels in North America, those animals, those huge animals, rather rapidly became extinct when, when humans arrived because we tended to, our ancestors tended to 
pick on the on the large you know females and um, and i'm afraid it, it, they weren't very used can to I, you we lost the polyphonic singing then did we? well can i, don't can know. I don't make know. a suggestion there mm. that yeah. polyphonic singing actually rests considerably on significant egalitarianism mm. and one of the ways that you may lose it is through um, undermining egalitarianism mm. there are there are very significant um, examples of polyphonic singing in various places but um but maintaining egalitarianism and gender egalitarianism may be extremely important for it i would i would put, 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 but that's possibly. linked thanks yeah but that's linked to the megafauna in other words you, you're going to get more egalitarianism where there's abundance of game uh, and less egalitarianism where you've got scarcity how because fascinating it's thank you of, it's a matter of this balance of of listening as much to others as you so, so nobody is dominating or no one kind of tune or, or one voice is dominant yeah. um, in polyphony. Um, Daniel, Daniel was going to ask another question, and then I'd really like to encourage some women to ask some questions, if it's possible. But Daniel, you wanted to go again. Daniel? No, I think his hands up. I think uh, Daniel's hands up because it's. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just, okay. I'm just quickly going to ask. Uh, you know, when you said that, um, I can't remember who, it, who it was that you said that said that um, language is purely a result of natural selection. But um, um, obviously, um, I, pro I agree with you that it's not that simple. Um, I was wondering, what do you think of like meme selection and also social selection as part of that to like create language? Like meme selection is in Dawkins' kind of idea of meme selection, and there's nothing wrong with that except you have to have right. you have to have right. symbolic culture to start with. So meme selection can't explain anything at all. But mm. once you've got um, symbols, then mm. like little elements of symbolism, which mm. you might want to call memes, um, mm. because they get transmitted down the, the generations, you can you can draw a certain analogy. Not very good analogy actually, but some mm. there's some similarity with the way genes are passed down or, or mm. some multiple or spread um mm. but uh, okay but i mean just the point i was making it's stephen pinker in the language instinct he simply says okay it's the, the explanation is ever so simple it's darwinism natural selection it's good to communicate accurately therefore it, it's obviously got advantages therefore it will evolve and those kinds of arguments are not saying that stephen pinker is not very interested in origins actually he just he just moves on to all sorts of other fascinating <laughs> fascinating topics but those who picked up on the same sort of idea, tend to say, okay, what's wrong with, with other animals that they can't talk? So what, 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 what's wrong with chimpanzees that they can't speak? And then, and then they'll say, well, they, maybe, maybe they've got inflexible tongue. I mean, that's a non-starter, they're incredibly inflexible tongues. Um, or maybe they're a bit stupid. I mean, all sorts of, sort of reasons why the sort of defects in other creatures mean that they don't talk. And that's the argument I'm opposing. I'm, I'm saying that these other creatures with their, you know, their food calls, their war barks, their pantoots and all those things, their duets with their gibbons, they are wonderfully adapted to the life they lead. Um, and you need to be, I mean, one of the things Witt, Wittgenstein said, which is beautiful, he said, to imagine a language is to imagine a form of life. So unless you're involved in human life, mm -hmm. life with you know, some things are sacred, you know, you don't just use violence and threats, some, there's a certain sense of a sort of moral community. And this, and, and that applies to all human life, actually, even in the most dire circumstances. I mean, you really, you're on, you're on the way to extinction if you don't have any kind of sexual morality, for example, if, if rape is, mm -hmm. and all that's allowed, that, 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 that particular group isn't, isn't gonna be around for very long. Mm -hmm. But um, so for language to evolve, you, you, there has to be a, 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 what we might call a human form of life. And then language yeah. is an internal component of that. And so don't, I, I'm just completely against the idea that, you know, the, the explanation for language is a flexible tongue, or the explanation for language is a gene called FOXP2. I and mean, that's another favorite. Yeah. And there's a that's just like, um, that's like a um, proximate and ultimate causation, isn't it, really? That's the it. ultimate causation is obviously longer and, 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 and much more, um, much more, um, what's the word, um, yeah. um, like detailed. And, and yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Right. Could we, um, Helen, Helena was maybe going to be able to ask a question? Yeah. Um, but we want some women to get into it. It's too quiet so far. Yeah, I can't unmute my video. I'm sorry. 
Uh, and just uh, just one small note, the polyphonic singing is quite, uh, if you can see in the chat, there are plenty of countries in Europe uh, where mm. it's still going on. Mm -hmm. And it is said that you shall never enter the forest without singing. And especially mm. the group of women would never go up, pick up berries uh, without making a lot of noise. Uh, otherwise, you would uh, surprise a bear or a wolf or, or some yeah. other creature who might eat you. So it's still going on. Um, and uh, also the other note, perhaps, uh, Chris, uh, did you thought of, did you think of uh, giving some, um, is there a li linkage to the well-known well -known myth of uh, Demeter and Babo? Um, because in many fairy tales, we have uh, the idea that precisely laughter, laughter is what gives life back. Um, the princess who didn't laugh is stopping the kingdom of, of, of all its uh, of reproductive power. So unless uh, someone comes and breaks the spell and princess laughs again, uh, then, then the life is back. So the laughter, point of the laughter is in many myths it's very much connected with reproduction. Oh, beautiful. I'm just reading your note here. Bravo entertains the nearly lifeless Demeter, shaking yeah. her hips and wiggling her breasts in a way that almost suggests sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. Then Bravo begins telling a series of jokes, regaling Demeter until she chuckles, then giggles, and finally gives in to deep and throaty belly laughs. The laughter revives Demeter. It enables her to continue her search for Persephone, in which is successful. In a few fairy tales, precisely laughter is what gives the life. Uh, various <laughs> princesses who did, uh, wonderful, Helenka. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. I mean, today, I mean, we just need, I don't know, it's difficult to laugh in these terrible times, you know, with mm. terrible cataclysmic mm. climate change and COVID. Yeah. But somehow we've got to laugh because there's no hope for anybody if we can't. I mean, it might be mm. gallows humor, might be difficult kinds of laughter. But I mean, you know, if we can't laugh in some way at the idiocies and absurdities of capitalism, mm. um, I don't know, we're mm. all we're all doomed. And uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's just uh, and uh, I don't know, it, it's the main medicine. And, it, and somehow mm. there's, there's not going to be a revolution uh, that, that, that unless we can sort of find a way of, of, of regaining our capacity for laughter. I think there will be a revolution because I think this whole thing is getting so desperate that in, in a sense all you can do is laugh at these complete clowns mm -hmm. uh, you know Donald Trump Boris Johnson and a whole lot of others I mean they might be you know criminals in a way but I mean somehow even if it is criminal laughter is the is the way to I mean it needs to be raucous laughter defiant laughter we need to defend ourselves while laughing don't be too feeble about it all but laughter is the the necessary antidote and the necessary you know, healing, if you like. And not only antidote, but the pre uh, precursor of, of language, as you've said. You know, the our prime minister is not being able to laugh at himself. Therefore, he's also not able to communicate nothing at all. <laughs> you know, so the whole communication breaks down without being mm -hmm. able to laugh at himself. <laughs> and, and one of the points that Jerome and I are trying to make towards the end of our book is the fact that we, in, in the planet at the moment, we don't even have language. I mean, Everyone's, yeah. speaking, everyone's speaking in their little bubbles. Everyone's, imagine, I mean, these funny little um, social media bubbles, these, you know, the, like we've seen this extraordinary development in, the, in, the, in America with these weird bubbles where the world is completely upside down. It's, mm. it's very, you can't talk to these people and they can't talk to us. I don't know how, yeah. how you know, what's, <laughs> how to get around all this, but I mean, mm. we've lost laughter, as you say, to a large extent and, mm. and language sort of in consequence of that because you know, they're so intimately connected. When, when, when everyone's had a good laugh, uh, you've sort of got over all these emotional difficulties. I mean, Gallo's laughter is really significant. You, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be able to laugh at the most ter horrific, horrible things. And then, and then you're sort of on top of it. And then yeah. you, once you've had a good old belly laugh, you've got enough, enough bonding and trust, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to talk to each other for the first time. Yeah. Um, I should perhaps say that I've just lost a comrade from COVID. Mick Brooks, one of my comrades in Neighbour Briefing, and what he was amazingly brilliant at when he would, he was nearly always uh, in, in what we call the Labour Representation Committee, which was uh, mm. just sort of Jeremy Corbyn and, uh, and John McDonald's kind of ne network with a whole lot of trade unions. What he would, he would, Mick would be our, our, our speaker, and the brilliant thing was, 
he would talk about Brexit or talk about some ridiculous, you know, economic policy. And somehow in a bitter way, we would all be laughing. It was somehow the laughter behind all of it, which, is, which made him a brilliant speaker. And he died about five, five days ago from COVID, um, a little bit younger than me. So I'm just saying, but I'm, I'm just saying, <laughs> the reason he was such a wonderful revolutionary speaker was his ability to laugh at things which other people would just find depressing. <laughs> um, any, there are lots of great contributions in the chat from many of the women there. Any more uh, contributions? Okay, can we have briefer questions, please? I suppose that's a good point. Um, I have. <laughs> yeah. I have if, 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 I, I've got one point to put in. Okay. And that is, what about? And um, perhaps this is something that Dasha might be able to talk to a bit. What about um, children? Isn't language going to come up from below, really, yeah. um, through children's yeah. interactions and social? If you're going to look at egalitarianism as a necessary context for evolving language isn't it going to be through children's games through children's interactions with adults and so forth very what very briefly that? one of the one of the chapters entirely on that i mean we, we, mm. in some ways jerome and i aren't very keen on the idea of a language instinct um, because where did it come from i mean it seems how weird it is that chimpanzees have zero language instinct and human children genetically very closely related seem to have a, a language instinct the way to get around that is to realize that we the animals including chimpanzees do have the the instinct and we call it the play instinct animals play but they mostly play when they're young and with chimpanzees the play fighting is brilliant incredibly clever at biting and scratching each other but only not like not for real it's just play but when sex comes along the play fight suddenly switches over to a horrible vicious violent fight where somebody gets hurt and what's amazing about humans is that we manage to maintain play, the playfulness of childhood, and, and sort of confront sex, um, subject sex to the rules of play, and make play sex itself kind of playful. And we call the rules of those you know, games kinship rules. <laughs> and, and so, yes, I, I, totally, I totally agree. Uh, it would have been no doubt about it. Children would have, would have got there before their parents. And, and even today, of course, with, you know, with a new form of digital communication, you know, all these strange digital uh, contraptions. I mean, everybody knows, don't they, that you need, you need, if you don't know how to work your computer or some weird you know, program or something, you need to ask a four year old and they'll, they'll sort mm -hmm. things out for you. So I'm sure that I'm sure that, for, that turning the world upside down would have applied. And of course, Camilla's absolutely right. These egalitarian hunter gatherer societies, they're basically they're not just child friendly. They're almost run by the children. The children have a, a you know, a, you know, have have the have the say. No one's allowed to punish a child, tick it off, speak, you know, you know, speak sternly to the children. The children's play is a kind of model for the rest of society. I can say something. This is Darsha. I can't unmute my video, uh, but in terms of of children. Uh, I think the nonverbal tactile is the, the first language. Uh, e. Richard Sorensen talks about pre-conquest consciousness and uh, explains his common experiences across the world living with pre-conquest peoples. And um, the emphasis on the communication was with tactile um, uh, touch with babies and babies were carried everywhere and everyone loved babies and they wanted to make the baby laugh and then the baby learns to make everyone else laugh and it's this kind of uh, at oneness individual at oneness he couldn't even come up with the words that described it but it was the enhancement of well-being through not only tactile but then eventually the words and and just uh, moving through the environment in ways that were communal and joyful. Mm. Oh, gosh, so, so, thanks so much for that. So, so absolutely true. And um, of course, one of our speakers here, not today, but Mona Finnegan has just written so beautifully and had a PhD as well, of course, about, the, about touch as the, as, the, as the fundamental language. I, I, I suppose all I'm, what I'm sort of trying to do at the same time, all all along, is is 
try to satisfy even the, the linguists, you know, the formal linguists who would say that singing has got nothing to do with grammar, touch has got nothing to do with language, you know, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm simply saying I'm trying to stretch the, 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 the kinds of things we're all talking about here, about the body and, and smiling and laughter and touch and everything, trying to make that also embrace those aspects of human language, which in the past, the linguists have sort of hived off from the body, from laughter, from, you know, touch, and, and say, no, this same, this same model can also explain those, if you like, formal aspects of, of language. That's but, wonderful. Yeah, I yeah. couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you post somewhere uh, a link to that, Mona Finnegan's, that piece on touch? Yeah. Um, it, why not search um, YouTube for Mona Finnegan or right. YouTube for Radical Anthropology Group and you'd come up with the videos. Right. Um, if you go to so our website, if you go, to, yeah. if you go to our website and click on the Vimeos, yeah. you'll find Mona up there. But as, but as Camilla <laughs> says, there's another version, a more edited version on YouTube. Sure. If you just Google yeah, Mona Finnegan sure, Touch. Shorter versions, Mona Finnegan Touched, uh, Touch on YouTube. Yeah. Yep. Right. Uh, if anyone hasn't come we'll across come that, if, as, yeah. as an intro to what radical anthropology is, what we believe, the most enchanting and amazing six minute um, video by Mourner on touch in, the, in an age of COVID um, and, and iPhones and screens. It's just absolutely magical introduction to a whole world of anthropology, really. And, uh, and Mourner is one of the people who was, it was with the bed jelly. Uh, and and just like Dutch was saying, a, a kid, it never, it never, it's never on the ground. It's never our Western idea that you put a kid in a cot and, and sing a lullaby to it. I mean, that's <laughs> among the bed jelly is born and Finnick and 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 Jerome of described that from the moment it's born, the, the child is just carried around, touched, held, loved, feeling warmth, laughter. I mean, it never, it never put. You'd never need to put it on the ground. There'll always be somebody who can carry that kid. And so it's just constantly embraced with, with you know, the feelings of love and, and caring and the sounds. Yeah. It, it, if uh, Dash or Jerome were here to talk about the, uh, the pygmy, the Central African um, camps, they would talk about how the care of children and what's happening with children. These are the most fundamental concepts of whether things are going well in the camp or things are going badly. So Igonjwa, this um, idea of the, the development, the growing of a child, and that if the children are happy, if there is laughter, then you know, everything is going to be going, for the camp is, is going well. But if there is crying, if there is noise, I mean, it's just the idea of noise and crying and, and things are going badly, people are quarreling and children are crying, that is, the sort of the ultimate of, of things are going wrong. Um, so life is being judged in accordance with whether things are all right with the children. That is the fundamental um, value. And, and, and if the children aren't feeling all right, they're crying or something, the forest spirits will be upset and the animals won't be caught, there won't be any honey. Or, uh, you know, you won't, you know, the, you know the, the forest is very generous but it needs to be kept happy with joyful laughter mm. and singing. Um, otherwise, those forest spirits um, just, you know, they, 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 won't, they won't open their hand. They won't, they won't you know, they'll, they'll, they'll withhold their riches, their resources. Um, mm. And of course, it makes perfect sense. I mean, it, it, because of course, a, a group which is riven with, you know, conflict and competition and, and you know, sh shouting and stuff, it won't, it won't get it together. It won't, it won't be successful. It makes a huge lot of sense. And of course, uh, putting children's need, make, making childcare the central work of the whole community makes a huge lot of sense because then, of course, that's that community will 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 you know will, will thrive or succeed. Any more? I, I just wanted to say one thing, which is I started out with the idea that you mustn't laugh at animals, and I'm I'm not going to say any more about it, but I just want you all to be. Kind of intrigued with that that thought because um, 
next week we're going to kind of go into all that and why why it is that Mojo turns into something like these groups of women who are laughing sort of become um, represented as um, Elan bulls, as kangaroos in other parts of the world, and as animals, so that the the laughing the laughing that you mustn't where you mustn't mock the animals is is intimately linked up with with you know with respect for um, you know the the, the the rules of of society. It's, it's, it isn't quite what it seems. It's not. There's a reason why laughing at animals is tabooed. Put it that way. <laughs> Even though you're hunting, it's just but Tam is wanting to. Do you want to ask another question, Tam? You haven't got your video. I I don't know how I cut you off. No, I, well, it just says that the host has disabled disabled me. I don't know. Uh, it was when I, oh, really? Come in, yeah. stop doing that. No, I haven't. It's not true. <laughs> you're <laughs> being the defamed. Host, the other one. But sorry, I, it wasn't that I wanted to say anything. I was just uh, trying to understand oh, why. Okay. And we could come back again. I'm oh, okay. No worries. I'm still here. No. Still enjoying it. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. I mean, there was one thing I was going to say that just in regards to COP26, um, right, that yeah. uh, that I've, I've become part of the family and children's group uh, on it. And this has really inspired me because I do think that even here in Glasgow, it's going to be the children that are going to need to lead the way on it and immediately when I started to think about ideas for it I just knew the children that would take to that so much more readily the idea of twinning with trees touching trees and so on it just so yeah. naturally mm. geared towards kids and that I think this guy exactly. Barry Butler that I bumped into who I think would mm. love that he loved Morna's talk he's a Tai Chi master he said we have mm -hmm. to connect with people emotionally and I thought that is the same way, that, that yeah. same sense that with children, you do that much more automatically as well, that you involve the emotional uh, when you're talking to them and everything like that, and when they're talking to you, that children have a much more natural sense of laughing and crying. And uh, so they're mm. children of the revolution. <laughs> mm -hmm. I want yeah. to um, tell us a little bit, yes. I know, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you live, and why you're talking about COP26, just briefly. Okay. I'm, I'm interested. Right, thank you. I don't know. Hopefully other people will. Just that I'm, I'm in Glasgow. Um, I was involved in a campaign here uh, to save a piece of land called the Children's Wood um, that was successful, amazingly, surprisingly successful, that we took the land from Glasgow Council and we now have it in community ownership. And it was because the whole campaign was fundamentally led by children. Um, and uh, Julia Donaldson, the children's laureate at the time, uh, she supported the campaign saying, this is like an outdoor community center. And uh, so I started off by reading her stories, being a local actor, the Gruffalo and so on. And it opened up a whole world of acting for me. Usually I'm playing sort of crazies and uh, lunatics and that sort of thing. Uh, but um, it, is, it revolutionized ideas for me of what, what uh, campaigning's about, what can become possible. And uh, it's then now led on to you know, the, the thoughts about COP26, because I'm here, I think, and there are other mm -hmm. people, other families that I've found as well that, that. And then, so I became part of this group. I got asked to come on, but I didn't realize it was a family and children's group. Um, and I, that made me then think as well, possibly, oh, well, maybe these radical anthropologists will not be really wanting to join. A, they all seem a little bit older and maybe they've gone past their uh, <laughs> time to, uh, <laughs> children. But no, no, maybe. no. I'm having a meeting with them tomorrow night, my first one. So definitely yeah. I'll, uh, I'll come back and keep you posted. And there's a lovely little child uh, with Mary there as well. It's going to lead the revolution, yeah. it looks like, yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I came across you through the Communist University, really. I was, I was, I was involved way back with the CPGB in, in lots of ways and doing, and I've always been interested in political theatre. And uh, you've just come along at the perfect time for me now as well, as things so often do. Yeah. 
yeah, it could just be, it could just be a moment. I mean, we could be, the world might be at a tipping point. Yeah. It probably is, and it probably yeah. could go either way. And you never know, a small yeah. group of us, maybe among many, many, many other little rivulets and streams all and threads, we could be one of them and we could just help tip it the right way and, um, and then we all live happily ever after. Yeah, that's it. It's all going to yeah, happen Jackie, in Glasgow. Ja Jackie right. has questions. Jackie had some interesting points. Have you got that, Jackie? Hello, everyone. Thank you. This is an amazing lecture, Chris. Um, yeah, I've got a question. I've got a background in theatre and youth work and dance. Um, my language study is about... Um, always been interested in root languages. I've had the Dwili for 20 years and in the last three months I've been learning um, Gaelic and Duolingo. Right. My main question is um, non-verbal communication came in first before verbal communication. You can easily say no with your hands. Yeah. Um, you can easily say no yeah. with a hand gesture. Um, it's so interesting that you're um, thinking about why somebody would not use a hand gesture to say no. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, if you think about chimpanzees, they're very bad at, at sort of at, at manipulating their, their, their vocalizations. In other words, they do vocalize, um, but they, what we do when we speak, we kind of, we eat while we're vocalizing. So we're phonating, we're making a sound, and then we, we do all the muscles and stuff with the jaw movements and tongue movements that we would not otherwise do with eating. Now, chimpanzees, of course, can do all those jaw, those movements of their tongue and their jaws and all that stuff, um, but they do it when they're eating. And when they're phonating, what they do is they close down the tongue. They close, when they go, ah, ah, yeah. <laughs> they're, 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 their lips and tongue you know, the stuff they use for eating isn't happening. And so you're quite right. The, 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 the kinds of parts of their bodies that they can use to intentionally signal will be their hands. And, and presumably that would have been the case for us, you know, a, a couple of million years ago, we would have started all those, um, you know, significant, um, you know, body movements, the precursors of speech using gestures. So, and, and that is, by the way, that I think that's today probably you know, the, the prevailing theory. Most people today think that language would have been initially gestural, not, not silent, probably with, you know, all kinds of vocalizations to sort of draw attention to yourself, but all the complicated stuff would have been more like signing than, 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 than language. But it's just that over time, once you've got that, that form of language, which is mostly gestural up and running, it would be, you can see why increasingly you'd need to use your hands for other things. So if you're using sign language, it's very hard to do the cooking to chop the vegetables you know, at the same time because your hands are so gradually gradually shifting from a almost purely gestural language to increasingly vocalized that language would make even more sense the whole thing is really interesting at the moment specifically i know i'm dance trained mm -hmm. so when i first was in a mask in supermarkets wandering around and behaving stuff and be, and smiling at people and being nice and lovely and stopping it was a game for me um because i've done a lot of dance um mm. um three meter rule was wonderful because it was just one rule and you don't go too fast and you don't go too slow yeah. and your whole body bows and there's lovely kind of recognitions and you totally exaggerate i totally exaggerated how i went shopping and people adore me because I can smile with my eye. You know, the, you know, yeah. my mouth was closed, but my eyes were smiling yeah. and I could gesture and I could do this sort of thing. So at the moment, this is really, really fascinating for me about body language, particularly how we have to do it when we can't speak particularly or yeah. even all that nonverbal stuff is interesting. So yeah. um, perhaps you have some thoughts on that as well. Not only that you're absolutely right. I mean, it's just so so lovely that you know, when, as soon as you as soon as you stop your, anything coming out of your mouth, everything has to come out through your eyes and everywhere else. It's just beautiful. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yes. The the peculiar thing about humans it, when we use spoken language, you know, is is that we we're, we're phonating, which means you know, our voice box is vibrating. We're producing all these sounds. 
while eating. It's an incredible thing. When, you, when you're talking, you're using all the movements which weren't evolved for speech at all. We're evolved for chewing and licking and tasting. You know, and, you know, it's a, it, quite incredible that those two things could have come together, producing signals and eating at the same time. That's what no chimpanzee will do. They will either do one or the other. They either make a sound and everything is locked down, or they will be eating, in which case they're not making a sound. We we eat our sounds. It's incredible. <laughs> so, um, any more any more questions now? Is that anybody else chip in? That was great great contribution there. Maybe that's a good time to wind up and look forward to to next week then. Yeah, so next week I'm going um, to try and solve that riddle. Really, really about, really I'm going to try and solve the, the sort of mystery, the, the kind of detective story element of the first chapter, what it is about laughing at animals, but also try to get from song to grammar, which is a bit of a, you know, an, a, 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 you know, a bit of a, an ask. It isn't that obvious but uh, and uh, it's been really oh. lovely today really fantastic it's so much I don't know so much politics which isn't politics so much politics coming from another place and not coming from you know wretched sectarian outfits <laughs> selling their wares you know their ideological wares so much wonderful moving um, speaking here going on and, and, and it's nice to see everyone's faces and movements as well so sorry if some of you got closed down it certainly wasn't by me and i don't think it was my computer no. i don't know what, I the, don't robot, so. what the zoom robot <laughs> thinks it's doing but it's <laughs> zoom robots taken over yeah um yeah, yeah there's steve my hey. i believe the say you got it back the seeing neanderthals oh, maybe next week or for my talk um i was gonna say tomorrow is a new dark moon new moon so happy new moon we we always make a lot of the moon yeah. in rag um, and some of us will be singing to trees not just hugging the trees but singing to the trees yeah. as this uh, lunar ceremony it's like the most basic religious ritual really to sing to a tree to connect to the sky to connect down to the roots to connect to each other in space and time so um, you can do that socially distanced wherever you are and there's no rules against hugging and touching and, very, uh, very intimately a tree's no bark. Rules, and yeah. You can get your arms... You if, you get your, if three or four of you can get your Hug arms right, right round an oak tree, it's a wonderful feeling. I'm sure everyone's done it when they were kids. Let's be kids again. OK, yeah. everybody, fantastic. Thanks so much. Right. See you next, see you next week. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye, then. Bye. 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 Thank Goodbye. you. Thanks very much.